Okay. Okay. Okay, everybody, you are very welcome this to meeting Cast is and being Tira. recorded. And uh, we're going to have an excellent talk tonight on Garota Sullivan, uh, which we will be hosting both live from America and from Ireland tonight with Joni Scanlon. And I'll introduce Joni properly in a minute, um, but just some housekeeping. Thanks to everybody who's come to visit us this evening, and to Limo Sullivan, Neve and Aideen Hassett, and Ben uh, for helping to organize this. So the way we look at it is you heard of the 1913 lockout. Well, we are having the 2020 lockdown and nothing is going to stop us from remembering our history uh, in this important centenary year. So some talks um, just to let you know about this week. On Tuesday at 8 p.m., Father Michael O'Flanagan, the rebel priest, will be on tomorrow. Um, on Wednesday, we have Collected Memories with Conquer O'Doolahan, who's on here tonight. Some great memorabilia that's going to be discussed there. On Thursday at 8 p.m., I'll be interviewing Dominic Price, where we'll be looking at the war in Mayo from 1919 to 1924, and it's going to be brutal in terms of the violence, but I mean that in, a, in an interesting way. Um, on Friday at 8 p.m., the War of Independence during 1920 with Owen Swift and Walsh will also be um, on, which is something that you really, really should have a look at too. My name is Marcus Howard. I run the Easter Rising Stories YouTube channel, which has 180 full-length documentaries and speeches. And you may have heard the news that both Trasnan and Tira and Easter Rising Stories were recommended by RTE's History Show and Liz Gillis as historical activities during lockdown. So there you go, recommended by RTE. So, Joni Scanlon, who we have here tonight, um, live from America, is a former journalist and newspaper editor and longtime professional writer. She is the author of Gerardo Sullivan's biography, A Sacrifice of the Heart, which is hot off the press and can be ordered through Michal of Dublin's Kilmainham Tales. That's www.kilmainhamtales.ie. Joni will be appearing also in an upcoming documentary I'm working on about Michael Collins. And if you have any questions, please post in the comments below. Thanks very much. And Joni, you're very, very welcome. Well, thank you. And thank you, everyone who's joined. I am so delighted to be here. I've been so passionate about telling Garod's story for some years, as anyone who's followed me on social media knows. Um, and I, I hope everyone is is well and, and staying safe during this lockdown period. And uh, my my thoughts are with you from a from from the United States to to Ireland. Uh, yes, yeah, so I've been passionate about this project. Uh, I started it uh, more than 15 years ago. It's it seems now. And you know, people say, why why did you want to write this book? And I think my the simple answer is. You know, he was forgotten by history, and you know, Marcus has mentioned I, I'm a former journalist. The sense of justice was is so strongly ingrained in me that the idea that he contributed so much and was forgotten just bothered me. Um, you know, I'd always known, I guess, about him. He he was my grandfather's uh, first cousin. Um, my grandparents, in fact, named their firstborn son after him. So he was always sort of a known figure in, in our family. But, you know, as a child, I didn't really know a lot about him. Um, you know, again, I, I grew up in the United States. It wasn't something I was really focused on. So it was really, I guess, in 2006, um, I, I visited the Skibbereen Heritage Center, which is located not far, <clears throat> excuse me, from the, from the farm overlooking Loch Hine, where my grandfather grew up. And when I walked in there, the archivist, uh, when, I, when I mentioned my grandfather, she said, you have someone really famous in your family. Um, and then she pulled out a really thin file folder, <laughs> and it was filled with a couple of newspaper clippings, and there wasn't much more. And, you know, I just wanted to, to, to learn more about him. So I am going to actually share my screen. I have a little bit of a presentation and some photos that I'd like to share with you. So if you could just bear with me for one moment. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, you know, the clippings that the archivist show, uh, shared with me 
when I visited the Skibbereen Heritage Center, as I mentioned, it, it was enough to kind of whet my appetite, but I really, I sensed that there was a lot more about him. Um, and I wanted to know more of the, the, the clips just kind of teased his history a little bit. Uh, back when I started, there wasn't a great deal of information to be found. Um, in the beginning, I would order any book off of Amazon or Abe Books. And, you know, when, wherever I saw his name mentioned in the index, some of the books were, were rare and pretty expensive. And I'd be so disappointed when the book arrived and I'd find, you know, that he was only mentioned in passing. I found that strange because he was once a household name in Ireland. Uh, his name was constantly in the press. He was often photographed or filmed. Um, and I'm just going to, I was going to share this, but due to some technical difficulties, I'm not able to show this. But this is a video that actually appears on my Facebook author page for Garoto Sullivan. And if you go there, you, you'll be able to find it and kind of watch it on your own. But this is a, a video of, of Garoto and Michael Collins walking on the uh, on, on base at the Portobello Barracks. I also came across a lot of misinformation about Garota Sullivan. Uh, Peter Hart's book on Michael Collins, which um, I know has been criticized, identified Garota as a member of the squad, which is false. Um, here, here he is, though, in a photo with, with several squad members. He's the one standing and holding the white hat. Um, as a key member of the general headquarters staff of the IRA, Garode would have had interactions with the squad members, but he wasn't a member of the group. Hart also described Garode as, Garode's role as adjutant general during the War of Independence as, quote, a mostly caretaker role. You know, knowing what I know now, I think that's, that's pretty laughable. Uh, Hart also described Garode as dislikable. All of those things I learned were untrue. The Oxford Dictionary of Irish Biography initially listed Garode's date of death as 1998, making him, as the book's editor said, quote, the last surviving veteran of the 1916 Rising. Um, that's also untrue. He, he actually died on the 25th of March, 1948, on Good Friday. Uh, this photo here um, shows his funeral cortege passing the GPO almost 32 years uh, to the day that he raised the tricolor there in 1916. So I sent the Oxford editors a copy of his obituary from 1948, the year he actually died. Uh, the error was repeated on his Wikipedia page, and it took months of squabbling with my fellow page editors to have that corrected. If any of you have ever tried to do that, it's you can edit something, and someone can go back and change what you, what you changed, and it, it could go on like that. And, and this is what would happen. I would correct the date and another editor would revert it back. Um, and there are other, other factual errors on the page too, which I ran into difficulties with. Um, but it turns out his official Doyle record also incorrectly reported his date as occurring in 1998. Um, and my, my fellow Wikipedia page editor was sticking with that. So I had to correct the government record as well. And I think the point I want to make here about that is the only information about him that was available on the internet when I started was the Wikipedia page. And it had so much misinformation that I really felt it was important to correct it. And then it annoyed me so much, I said, well, I'll have to just put my own record out there. And that's what started me uh, really pushing forward with this book. Um, so even the National Library um, of Ireland perpetuated the misinformation. And I don't mean to disrespect the library. The, the staff there has been very helpful to me in my research. But for years, the library identified this soldier on the right, who's also named O'Sullivan, as Garoto O'Sullivan. And as a result, the incorrectly captioned photo was plastered all over the internet. It took quite an effort to convince some web page editors that the man on the right looks quite different from the man on the left who is in fact the real Sullivan. Uh, the military archives witness statements were a great resource for me. Uh, but again, when I started my research, the, the records have not yet been digitized. So the process was painstakingly slow and particularly challenging since I was you know, primarily doing my research during short annual trips to Ireland. In terms of research, my real breakthrough came when I learned that Garode had one surviving daughter, Chevelle. 
who was living in San Francisco with her husband, Brian. And that's Shabelle, the, the, the girl, the second girl on the left, that's, that's Shabelle O'Sullivan Witty. Um, I have a street address, but nothing more. So I wrote an old fashioned letter asking if we could meet. After waiting more than a week for a response, I received a lovely letter from Brian inviting me to visit. That was on a Thursday. <laughs> and by Saturday of that same week, I had my tickets and I flew across country from New York to San Francisco on my way to interview Chabelle. And I learned so much from Chabelle. But more importantly, the idea of Garod the man and not the remote historical figure I had been chasing emerged. I learned from Chabelle that Maud Kiernan, uh, she's seated next to Garod there, was the love of Garod's life. He would take the children out on weekend adventures in order to let Maud sleep in. And when they returned home, according to his daughter, he'd always stop to buy a box of sweets for Maud. She was one of the Kiernan sisters, known at the time for their charm and beauty. Garod's and Maud's wedding was to have been a double ceremony with Maud's sister Kitty and Michael Collins. Sadly, came a wedding of only one couple. And there's a photo from their wedding. Um, there's some prominent people in, in the photo, and I, I sort of identified them in the caption there, but members of this family are there, uh, his brother, his sister, his aunt. Um, unfortunately, his brother, Tyg O'Sullivan, is not there. He was on the run because this occurred during the Civil War, and he was anti-treaty. So just another example of how the Civil War divided families. I also learned from uh, Chabelle that Garod was a doting father and loving husband, a gruff but soft-hearted man who showed his children how to plant flowers in the garden he tended, and who took them all around Dublin on weekends to visit its museums and cultural institutions. I learned that he wanted his children to be open-minded and arranged for them to be educated in progressive, non-traditional schools to foster that outlook. That actually angered the local parish priest who thought it was scandalous his children weren't attending Catholic schools and threatened to have Garode excommunicated. I learned that he was deeply loved by his children and over time I grew to understand why. The last time I saw Shabelle, she grabbed my hand as I was saying goodbye, looked into my eyes and told me insistently he was a good man. It was as though she knew that in the course of my research, I might find some information about him that was less than favorable, which I did in fact find. I believe that she wanted my impression of him to be fairly balanced. It was the memory of that last meeting with Chabelle that kept me going for more than a researching and writing Garod's biography. It was very important to me and to Chabelle that people knew who he was and that he not be forgotten. I've dedicated the book to Chabelle because she was truly my inspiration for this project. So who was Garode O'Sullivan? <laughs> High level, here's what's important to know about Garode. He was an Irish teacher, Irish language scholar, army officer, later a barrister, and Sinn Féin and Fine Gael politician. He was born in, 19, I'm sorry, in 1891 on a farm just outside of Skibbereen to a prominent West Cork farming family with strong revolutionary roots. He excelled in school and was noted for his early brilliance. Irish was spoken in the family home. His father defiantly completed the 1911 census in Irish. At age 10, he joined the local Gaelic League with the connections he made there with local Sinn Féin League, drawing him further into the revolutionary movement. He left home at 18 to take up teacher training at St. Patrick's College of Education in Dublin. And while not quite 19, had already completed a second, the second arts examination of the Royal University of Ireland, taking up teaching in 1911. He subsequently earned an advanced degree in education at the National University. In his early days in Dublin, as a member of the Gaelic League, he taught Irish language classes and with his distinctive Cork accent was noted as a fine Irish language speaker and especially gifted teacher. As one of his former students who attended his 1948 funeral would note, quote, he could teach Irish in a way that a boy could learn from him, and that was what more of them couldn't do. 
Along with his longtime friend, Keenan Lynch and Pierce Beasley, among others, he also participated in an Irish language acting troupe, translate, which translated from Irish was known as the Players. The troupe traveled the country producing plays in Irish and even appeared on stage at the Abbey Theater. Of all that he did, I think he was proudest of this work. He touched on this in his Doyle speech on the treaty and later wrote that the role of the Gaelic League and other institutions such as the GAA with their mission of instilling cultural pride in all things Irish was a critical, critical component of any revolution. Here's what he had to say about that in the memoir he, he was writing, but unfortunately, and to my great dissent, abandoned after only 16 pages. Quote, perhaps to the Gaelic League more than to any other movement is due the credit for concentrating the thoughts and reflections of the youth of Ireland on their own country, on its history, its language, its economics. Recruited as its members were from different political parties, supported by persons differing in religion, economic outlook, and social standing, all with one common end, it was only natural that the vast amount of work performed voluntarily for that end should enkindle a new spirit into the persons engaged in it and invigorate the real patriotism of the race. His early days in Dublin were also filled with big and adventure. He was heavily involved in gun running and other activities in the years preceding the rising and was storing a significant weapon stash above the ceiling in the boarding house room he shared with, with Lynch and later with Michael Collins at 16 Mountjoy Street in Dublin. As early as 1913, he and his closest friends, Lynch and Dermot O'Hegarty, were also perfecting the cat and mouse games with authorities that Michael Collins would later become famous for. In 1913, Grode was appointed to F Company 1st Battalion, which was said to be the best of the Dublin Brigade. And around this period, he also became a member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. He was a close confidant of Sean McDermott, who likely swore him into the IRB and became an important mentor. McDermott, who was known for his secretive nature, found he could trust Grode. He asked Grode to serve as his aide-de-camp during the rising and drew him into early planning efforts for the rebellion. It's for this reason that Garode fought with the GPO garrison rather than with the 1st Battalion <coughs> under Ned Daly. McDermott was an important mentor to Garode. In return, Garode was clearly very fond and protective of McDermott. He also felt that McDermott didn't get enough credit as one of the key architects of the Rising, along with Tom Clark. Garode wrote that, quote, Sean was one of the most serious of all the conspirators, and yet the one who had the greatest sense of humor. Rudd also pointed out in the mid-1920s that McDermott, quote, appears to be the least mentioned of the 1916 leaders, though without doubt he and Tom Clark were the two persons most responsible for the insurrection of 1916 and the events which led up to it. Their names are not as often invoked in that connection as those of others, because they have left little or nothing behind them in the nature of writings or speeches. Yet they, and very often they alone, work through dark and dreary years, spreading the doctrine of Irish freedom throughout a land which did not wish to hear. Garode himself is perhaps best known as the man who raised the tricolor above the GPO in 1916. Less known is that he took part in the harrowing charge down Moore Street as part of the advance guard exiting the burning GPO. During the charge of the Overhealy, a small contingent of men attempted to storm a British machine gun barricade at the foot of Moore Street with the ultimate goal of clearing a path for insurgents evacuating the burning GPO and ultimately securing the William and Woods confectionery factory on nearby Kings Inn Street. Following the rising, Garod was interned in Frongot, make, a makeshift prison for some 1,800 Irish inmates consisting of two camps. Internees have described Frongot's south camp, an abandoned distillery, as a drastically overheated facility overrun with rats that crawled over their faces as they tried to sleep at night. For most of his time at Frongot, Garod occupied the slightly preferable north camp, along with fellow internees Michael Collins and Dick Mulcahy. The three men occupied what the other internees dubbed 
the quote, leader's hut at Frangop. In his witness statement, Joseph Good recalls that Garode, Collins, and Mokahi were perceived as, by the other men as, quote, natural leaders. Good wrote, quote, there was no attempt, so far as I can remember, to appoint these men as leaders. They led by their natural gifts and ability, which instilled confidence in their followers. Well, at Frangok, Garode and Collins organized a campaign to document dismal conditions in the camp, which ultimately made it out to the wider world and brought some relief to the prisoners. Garode also led a hunger strike to protest conditions. This would leave him in a severely weakened state. He became violently ill, so much so that his fellow hutmates had to crawl into bed with him on either side to keep him warm. Yet when a camp chaplain tried to get him to call off the hunger strike, noting that he and others could die, he calmly responded to the priest by quoting from the Bible, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Nearly seven decades later, Bobby Sands would use the same quote in responding to a priest who also tried to get him to end his hunger strike. Upon his release from Frangok, Garode resumed his involvement with the Republican movement, intensifying his volunteer activity as commandant of the Carlo Brigade, while also working as master of Irish studies at Nottbeg College. He was arrested several times during this period, including once in a case of mistaken identity where he was blamed for giving a seditious speech that had actually been delivered by Michael Collins. He sat mute in the Skibbereen courtroom rather than cast blame on Collins. As a result, he spent months in Mountjoy jail. In 1917, he was elected to the Supreme Council of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, and in that same year to the Volunteers Executive Council. He abandoned his teaching career in 1919 in order to assume the role of adjutant general. As adjutant general, Garode served as the army's chief administrator and disciplinarian, ensuring that an organization often teetering on the brink of dysfunction functioned as smoothly as possible. During the War of Independence, daily communication with the field was one of his major responsibilities, with field commanders receiving most of their GHQ orders and sending field reports through his office. Here, I can't stress enough the importance of Garode's role as adjutant general from the Army's inception, I'm sorry, from the Army's inception as the volunteers through to its maturity as a professional national army. In the early days, the Army was ragtag. Many soldiers were part-time and inexperienced in fighting. Volunteers had to be schooled in the most basic things. I saw one memo issued from Garode's office stressing the importance of washing one's feet and wearing well-fitting boots on long marches. There was no formal enlistment process. One of the most painstaking tasks Garode faced was trying to establish a military census in order to bring order to the process, and that wasn't accomplished until after the Civil War. His office also had full responsibility for operating the military courts and prisons, policing, communications, and tragically, the government's execution policy during the Civil War. Gradually, Garod developed divisions within his office with responsibility for the Army records, recruitment, discipline, legal affairs, prisoners, medical corps, chaplains, and a central registry. Garod also played an informal advisory role during the treaty negotiations, traveling to London to meet with Collins and returning to Dublin to keep their IRB network apprised of developments. He initially opposed the treaty when he felt Ireland was being offered much less than a republic, and at one point cautioned the IRB to remain on high alert. But he later threw his support behind the treaty and voted to ratify it as a member of the Second Doyle, to which he had been elected. Like Collins, he ultimately came to see the treaty as a stepping stone to greater freedom. Garode, along with Collins and Dick Mulcahy, were also working with anti-treaty leaders to surreptitiously support IRA efforts in the north of Ireland. Those efforts ended with Collins' death in 1922. Garode's uh, role as a member of the military council during the Irish Civil War was horrific. As adjutant general, he was required to attend all court hearings involving military defendants and to review all military court ordered sentences 
other than those involving the death penalty. In the latter case, he, along with other members of the Army Council, had the grave responsibility of reviewing and confirming death sentences. The Civil War was a war he worked desperately to prevent. Because of his West Cork roots and deep connections, Garode was someone each side trusted, and he was involved in multiple peace-finding initiatives in the period between the treaty ratification and the four courts bombing by free state forces that led to full-blown war. He and his brother Tygo Sullivan, who was anti-treaty and served as quartermaster general under generals Tom Barry and Liam D.C., also quietly initiated one of the most promising peace, peace initiatives of the time period, which unfortunately would fail. And here you see the pro and anti uh, figures who, who came together at a series of meetings at the Mansion House to try to find uh, a peaceful settlement uh, and prevent a civil war. Um, this was just one of at least four or five uh, negotiating sessions that Garod was involved in uh, in, the, in the months leading up to the Civil War. Garod chose not to run for re-election after his post-treaty term in the Doyle expired. He was shifting his focus to shape Ireland's new national army and believed it important to separate the political from the military mindset. But in 1924, his military career came to an abrupt end when Minister for Justice Kevin O'Higgins who was a former romantic rival, seized the opportunity of a mutiny attempt by demobilized officers to force Garode and other members of the military council to resign. Garode returned to political life under tragic circumstances when O'Higgins was assassinated in 1927 by anti-treaty forces and the party leaders asked Garode to run in the by-election for O'Higgins' seat. He won by a landslide and was elected to office four more times. He was a popular politician, known as an advocate for the poor, for teachers, for soldiers, and for environmental justice. But he was an unlikely one. He was blunt spoken and painfully honest. A catchphrase he'd use was, cross off the knots, meaning don't exaggerate. More often than not, People know of Garode because of his close relationship with Michael Collins. The two men were the same age, both only 25 during the Rising. They were cousins and would have been brothers-in-law as they were set to marry the Kiernan sisters in a double wedding. In his witness statement, Republican Judge Kevin O'Shiel describes Garode as Collins' quote, constant companion. Volunteer Dennis Daly describes Garode as being in the quote, inner of the inner circle, end quote of Collins' advisory circle. History sometimes records the Collins of Sullivan relationship as a superior subordinate one, but that wasn't really the case. They had much in common. They were core, they were the stage, and they shared a similar pragmatic outlook. During the War of Independence, they served as co-equal members of the headquarters staff under Chief of Staff Dick Mulcahy, with Collins responsible for intelligence and Garode managing his duties as adjutant general. Here are a few photos taken during Michael Collins' funeral. You see Garode leading the military contingent with Dick Mulcahy on the right, uh, both wearing black armbands. I, this photo on the left, I, I couldn't find the original photo. Uh, I, I really wanted to, to use in my book, but it just doesn't exist, I guess. But I thought Garode, who's standing behind uh, the second and third buglers in this photo, his face, I mean, you could just see the devastation on his face. He was, he was devastated by the loss of Michael Collins. And I, I think he, it just shows on his face here. Garode spoke often of Michael Collins. On Sunday walks along Hartcourt Street, he regaled his children with stories about the escapades that two men shared as they escaped over rooftops during the revolutionary period. In more serious discussions, his profound grief over the loss of his closest friend would surface. And he would also lament the direction in which Ireland was heading since Colin's death. He would say, if Mick had lived, things would have been different, his son recalled in a newspaper interview. In a sense, when Michael Collins died, the world stopped for a lot of people. Their vision was blown apart, their energy gone. 
Garode is perhaps best known for having raised the tricolor above the GPO in 1916. Yet for even that accomplishment, he has been largely forgotten. I, vid I visited the GPO exhibit in 2016, and nowhere in the exhibit was he or his role in raising the flag mentioned. As adjutant general for almost five years, he occupied multiple offices around Dublin, where he masqueraded as a businessman, including in Eustace Street, and in an office above a former tailor shop in Lower Ormond Quay. There's no plaque on any of those buildings mentioning him. For several years after the treaty, he lived and worked in Portobello Barracks, now renamed for Cajal Bruja. But on a recent visit there, even that barracks tour guide didn't recognize his name. There's not a single street or bridge named for him anywhere in Ireland. The only recognition that he's received is a plaque on the town hall in his native Skibbereen, shown here on the left, and his name engraved on his gravestone at Glasnevin Cemetery. The fact that he lived, fought bravely, risked his life, and sacrificed so much, and had been so completely forgotten, violated my sense of what's fair and just, and that's what motivated me to write this book. Thank you. Well done, Joni. That was fantastic. That was really, really good um, presentation. Thank it you. really um, makes you angry at the fact that he was so written out of um, Irish history. It was really brilliant. Yeah. Um, we have a few questions. I'll just read out from um, the audience, and I'll ask you one or two also afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, Liam O'Sullivan has asked, you'd be interested in learning if Joni Rhodes's role to sign off on the executions during the Civil War had an impact on him in later life, like would it have played on his mind? That's... Yeah, it, it did. He, he um, you know, I've, I've come across several, several references to, you know, PTSD mm. that he and others suffered. Um, his children, you know, his daughter told me that he would never, he would never watch any film having to do with that period. He, he, he just totally averted his gaze from anything that had to do with, with, with the revolutionary years. His son, um, who was actually named Michael Collins, um, named after Michael Collins, wanted a toy gun and he would not let him have one. He was, he was, he became a real pacifist. I think, I think it wore very heavily on him, you know, his, his experience uh, during the Civil War. Um, um, another question is, um, is there confusion over who raised the flag in the GPO? Yeah. Uh, after his obituary appeared in 1948, a couple of uh, a couple of guys claimed that they were the ones who had done it. Now, I think there was confusion, and I kind of address it in my book by saying there were multiple flags raised in 1916 in various buildings, and there might just be some confusion about that. I, I don't think that there's any confusion that he did raise it. I, he, you know, as I said, he was bluntly honest. He had a reputation for being that. There are a lot of uh, records and accounts from his, you know, people who he fought with in 1916 and friends and, and so forth. It's actually even on his, uh, on the two plaques I shared on the town hall in Skibbereen and on his, on his gravestone. So I, I don't think there's any doubt that he, he raised the flag above the tricolor in 1916. He was asked to do so by Patrick Pierce. But I think there there might just be legitimate confusion about it. Sure, sure. Um, Liam has asked as well uh, how his relationship with his brother Tig developed over the course of his life. Like, were they reconciled or always split apart? Or that that's a happy story. Um, they were they 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 were a very knit family, and uh, you know there's a chilling um, comment that Garod made when he was talking, I guess during the army mutiny, there were hearings and mm. he talked about how his brother was arrested, um, but if he had been arrested a few months earlier, Garod might have been signing his own brother's death warrant. Oh. So it was, it was a horrible period. Um, but they did, they did reconcile. And actually, in fact, uh, Garod's children spent many summers on, on a farm that Tig had, uh, owned in 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 uh, county cork 
Okay. So I was happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah, that could have went really, really terribly uh, wrong. Yeah. It is like brother against brother around that period. Um, could, it was. Could you tell me a little bit more about the plan double wedding with Michael Collins and Kitty Kiernan in 1922? That's such a sad story because they were initially planning the wedding to for the wedding to occur in June of that year. Hmm. And... Um, they postponed it because of what was going on, you know, with the with the, the build up to the Civil War, and they postponed it. I think twice um, over that summer, the two sisters flew to went oh, not flew. Uh, they went to Paris uh, to to buy, you know, to purchase their wedding trousseau, wedding gowns, and uh, they finally settled on a date in October of 1922. Um, and everything was planned, and we know what happened in August of 1922, unfortunately. So I, I think I mentioned Garod was the, the, the one who actually had to tell Kitty that Michael Collins was dead. And, um, you know, it was, it was a, sad, a sad wedding in many respects. You, I think um, there are, there are uh, film clips that, that show the wedding, which um, I think British Path hosts them. And you can see Kitty at the wedding all dressed in black and she's crying. It, it's heartbreaking. Well, it's been very tough for everybody at the uh, mm -hmm. wedding. Um, Jerry Mulally, a uh, super lecture, Joni. Great details and photos. Traumatic life, uh, terrible, tough decisions had been made by somebody. And Ross O'Connor has asked, I hear of his connection to Fine Gael. I wonder what he made of the common Gael government which rose to prominence in the earliest version of the Irish Free State. Some of their policies might seem to be purposely at odds with the Republic that the people in 1916 would have envisaged, you know, or I know mm -hmm. it's a hypothetical question, but do you have any thoughts on it? Or? I, I suspect in some respects, the leadership of the party weren't 100% confident of, mm. of what camp he lie in. Um, this, this comes up in the Army mutiny hearings uh, where Kevin O'Higgins was and, and others really forced him out of the Army. Um, what, just to make a long story short, he and Mulcahy were trying to reinvigorate the IRB yeah. uh, as, a, as a negotiating tool, I guess, with... with was um, Logan trying to re reinvigorate, is this? Garuda yeah. Logan? Is, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry, go on. So, so I so I think he he they weren't quite sure of, of where his loyalties lie. <laughs> um, I I think he he was really trying to walk a fine line. He was trying to kind of move the country forward. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the stepping stone theory. Um, but I, I I think he wasn't a hundred percent trusted by the leadership of the party. Okay, uh, Mary Enright has asked, what is the location of the grave in Glasnevin? Um, it's, if you walk in, um, past where Colin's grave is and you walk, I think that's a few, a few rows down, uh, to the left, if you turn left, so it's like four rows down from there and you turn left, you'll find it. Uh, Brendan Behan's grave is, is just on the other side of his, just around the corner. Oh, <laughs> so right, if okay. you're familiar with the poet's grave, it's, they're, 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 they're roommates for all time now. <laughs> Well, he's a good bedfellow, I suppose. Um, Veronique Crombe, hello, by the way, Veronique. Uh, could you elaborate on the way Garode wanted his children to be educated, which you mentioned briefly at the start? Yeah, he he um, he enrolled them in in progressive schools. He, you know, he he was an educator himself, and he he just really wanted them to have an open mind on things. He he wanted them to pursue excellence. Uh, you know, when his daughter, for instance, she studied nursing, she, she wondered whether she should continue her studies in nursing or, or you know, or, or pursue advanced uh, training as a midwife, for instance. And, and he, he advised her to always, you know, seek higher learning um, and also that no nurse worth, worth her salt uh, should not be able to deliver babies. But he, he, um, he really felt you know, he had he had really strong ideas about education and the quality of education, and you see a lot of that in his his speeches in the Doyle. He he really was an advocate for teachers and for for good schools. 
uh, the schools in Dublin were deplorable at that time. So he, you know, really um, advocated for, for, for teachers. He was always in the corner of teachers and, and the quality of education in general. Um, the, sad, the sad story about that, though, is he, he suffered a stroke. And um, his and Maud, his wife, was a little superstitious. The, the parish priest came to her and told her he suffered the stroke because his kids weren't in Catholic schools. Really? So she promptly enrolled them in Catholic schools, <laughs> um, probably causing causing him to have another stroke. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Um, Conquer O'Doolahan, uh, look forward to getting my hands on a copy of your book. Well done. And I'm just saying Thank I'm you. a in one as well. I'm not just joking about that. I really, really am. I think it's brilliant that you're writing them back into the history. Uh, Adriana Mora, who is both our friends, who will be in the next Michael Collins film with you, Joni. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Joni. Great lecture. Love to hear more about the road. I'd like to make a quite delicate question. Uh, what was his relationship? Uh, sorry, what was his relationship with the so-called blue shirts? Yeah, that's um, that's a sketchy period in, in history, and I debated how much I wanted to write about it in the book. I don't think he had a very strong connection. Um, I, 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 he, he, as a barrister, he did represent a few members of the organization, so he had a peripheral involvement. I think I, I think for for some, they 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 were you know, philosophically engaged, but I think for many others, it was more of a, like a, a protection organization. He, for instance, his, his home was raided by, by um, uh, you know, De Valera's administration. That he, they, they sent them to raid his home, to search it for a gun. He was subject to, to death threats, as many of them were, you know, the, the, the bad feelings you know, from the from the Civil War hadn't gone away. So I think for some, it was more of a pragmatic thing to just, you know, surround yourself with with other people who, you know, strength in numbers. Um, they, they were trying to do political rallies and they would be they would be assaulted, you know, trying to just just, you know, run for elected office. So for some, you know, there there might have been, a, a as I said, a philosophical outlook on that. But I think for others, it was more pragmatic. Okay. Uh, Ross O'Connor has said, great. Thank you, Joni. Uh, Celine Collins, wonderful presentation. Very well done. Thank you. Uh, Liam O'Sullivan, having watched Joni on her journey to tell Garode's story, I'd like to commend her in her unfailing efforts over an, an extended period of time to ensure the story is told. Huge congratulations. And maybe mention the book again, Joni. You should actually. Where's the book available? Kilmainen, uh, let, let me just say, I think oh, I should have shared my, my slide. It's um, Kilmainen um, Tales is, is the publisher, and it's available on their, their main website, which um, is Kilmainen Tales, i.e. Yeah, www.kilmainentales.ie. Uh, also, um, Ben McKelta, my two Joni. Uh, Vega Roge Fear Rodul Assas. Sorry, my Irish is brutal. Thanks for highlighting what would otherwise be a lost story. I have to agree there. Adriana Mora, thanks, Joni. is very enlightening. Brian O'Neill, thank you for the great lecture. Neve Hassett, thank you, Joni. It was a truly gripping story delivered with great heart and knowledge. Paul Reed, thank you, Joni. That was really interesting. A story I wasn't that aware of that much before. And I'd just like to say as well, if you think about this man, this man raised a tricolor over the GPO. He was in Frong Oak with Michael Collins and Richard Mulcahy, who were key to GHQ during the War of Independence. He was adjutant general. He was uh, involved in the Civil War. He was to have a double wedding with Michael Collins, and he's forgotten about it. And I think that's a crime, and I think it's a credit to you for writing him back into our history. Really, what you're doing is so important. Um, thank so you. Thank you very much, Joni, for doing that. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. and and listening and learning a little bit about Garod and go forth and tell others and, you know, uh, and, and write your own stories. I, I have spoken to so many relatives who have the same story about their relatives, you know, who, who've been forgotten and just be an advocate, right, for them. Uh, and, and many of you are, many of, many of the relatives I've, I've met with are very passionate about it. Okay, well, thanks guys. And again, that's coming up this week as well. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Want to give a round of applause? Turn off all the.
to mute and give a round of applause. Well done, Joe, Tony. <laughs> Thank you. No one to worry, you get a round of applause. <laughs>